Hello and welcome to the Cinementalist podcast for Cinementalist.com. My name's Andy, sitting next to me is Floki, our bearded dragon mascot, and sitting opposite me is Liam. How's it going, dude? I'm very splendid for us, mate. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Well, you know, this is obviously the New Year's episode that we're recording now, but as we are recording right now, it is two days until Christmas. Yeah, for everyone else, there has been a Christmas. Yes, indeed. And for but, us, it's Christmas Eve. But you, Eve. Are li- you are you are listening to it. You are travelling back in time by listening to this because it is a few days ago before Christmas, and I am actually feeling in a pretty good mood. You know what? The Christmassy thing kind of hit me today. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we can't really talk about it because for the rest of our audience, it doesn't really matter. No, it's How was a- your Christmas? Sorry? Good, I hope. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave that there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, it is about to be a New Year's as well. It certainly is. For both of us and uh, for the rest of the world as well, I believe. I believe that's how that, that whole thing works out. Does it? You might know better than I do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, on our premium episode this week, uh, we're going to be doing our end of year roundup. We are, yes. Which I'm quite excited for. It's a chance to uh, pick out some highlights for everything we've reviewed this year. Big time. And... Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think I might have one or two picks that, uh, well, they qualify because they're this year's releases, but I didn't actually get round to reviewing them on either the main or the premium, so I can stick a nice little fresh inserts in there. For oh, people. cool. There's a title if there ever was one. I, I haven't done that. And yes, fresh inserts is, yeah, it, it sounds like still, a- I mean, No, the bulk of it is things that I've gone over before, but, you know, there's also new things to introduce people to. Wow, okay, well, you've gone further than me. Anyway, I'm just going to go over a load of stuff I've talked about already. Well, but, you know, well, just, but in summary form and with a bit more energy and bounce because we'll be really excited about there was this show and there was that show. 100%. But in the meantime... It's in theory, anyway. In theory, yes. yes. <laughs> in the meantime, though, there's the podcast for the rest of you reprobates. <laughs> indeed, indeed. In which we do our usual thing of a bit of film news and then two film reviews from Liam and then I've got a couple of TV things to talk about. But yes... Let's kick off with some film news. Uh, This made my heart sink, Liam. Uh, BBC News article, Christmas movie production snowballs, terrible pun, to reach (laughs) a new record. I hate it when they do that. Like, yeah, British Airways shares go up and they go, oh, British Airways shares taking off. You think, just fuck off with that joke. Anyway, anyway. Wankers. Uh, Yes, Christmas movie production snowballs to reach new record. Settling down in front of feel-good festive movies has become a modern Christmas tradition and has driven the production of seasonal films to record-breaking levels this year. More than 200 new feature films and TV movies with the word Christmas in the title. They've all got Christmas in the fucking title. (laughs) This is how I know not to watch it. Are listed on the Internet Movie Database, or IMDB for short, for release in 2021. That number has doubled since 2016 and is four times more than in 2011. Channels and streamers have discovered festive films are big ratings winners. Christmas movies have been popular for decades. It goes on and on. But yes, essentially, there is a huge, huge number of um, Christmas films been released and currently in production. Christmas movies seem to be a huge burgeoning market. Well, I mean, we, as on last week's premium, we discussed uh, our favourite depictions of Santa. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ergo, some of our, some Christmas films that we actually like because they are existent. But... I mean, I think we named a lot of the good ones. I mean, most Christmas... I mean, what, what, what Christmas films are you talking about? All the Hallmark stuff? Fucking Last Christmas with Amelia Clark? That what people are... They're chomping at the bit for that kind of thing, are they? Yeah, yeah. There seems to be a never-ending desire for more and more, especially Hallmark Christmas movies. But they're now, fucking god-awful. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes. Uh, I've spoken many times about my girlfriend's love for them. As uh, you know, She loves trashy cinema, but only in the Christmas drama, which I find very, very intriguing. As a result, they're often on the background um, from about September onwards. And um, I can tell you, having watched at least uh, this year alone, I think in the background, I've probably watched about 50 of them. They've all got the same plot. Yes. They literally all have the same plot. It's small town America and someone from New York City gets to go back home for Christmas. And, you know, do they discover the true meaning of love? Of course they fucking do. And there's a really good looking guy that's after, you know, there's a there's always a small town girl, maybe an author, or she runs a small Christmas gift store or something. There's about to be a big Christmas event, but then big business moves in and is big business going to shut down Christmas for this small town? And then it yeah. doesn't, and they fall in love and the film stops. And it, course, that's all of them. And, all of and them. pretty often you also have a magical or in parentheses, creepy Santa. Oh, yes, yeah. Magic Santa is always a good one when he crops up and um, shows. uh, There's been quite a few I've watched where it's 
you know, a woman's got a good career going for her again in New York City. It's always New York City for some reason. Um, but she meets a magic Santa and she wonders aloud to the magic Santa what her life would have been like had she decided to stay in her small town rather than go and be very successful. What if she'd been a homebody yeah. instead? And the magic Santa makes her into a homebody. And then by the end of the film, she decides that being a homebody is better than having a successful career and money. Now, what that says about the creators of these films? Yeah, but, but why? Why are the magical Santas always creepy? Yeah, like if, if you if you are a being with the power to bestow someone's deep, you know deepest wish, even if they don't know it, I can understand it if you're the Jin from Wishmaster. But being all weird and creepy and slightly sinister, it's a Christmas film. Shouldn't there be something magnetic about them instead of always like, oh, well, what if I did certain things? What I've, been, what I've been waiting for, actually, as a critic, is I've been waiting for one of these Hallmark movies to actually stand out as, actually, that's not bad. And then I'd review it. I'd go, you know what? This is a Hallmark Christmas movie that's actually quite good. I have yet to find one. It's not going to happen. I've watched many. Oh, so many. It's not going to happen. And as usual, you know, I'll, I'll eat many things if it does happen. Words, hats, shoelaces, whole <laughs> shoe as Herzog once did. Yeah. A bit. But no, it's, no, I, I, it's not going to happen, which is a shame. Uh, my next article this week, this is from inews.co.uk. Star Wars and Lord of the Rings scarier today as film censors upgrade age ratings. So this is apparently an analysis for the uh, BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification. So we're talking about British ratings here. But yeah, they've been going through some classics and deciding that actually for a modern audience, they deserve higher age ratings. Um, we've got a few in the article here. The Empire Strikes Back, Jaws, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Lord of the Rings, and Ghostbusters are among the classic films which have been reclassified by the BBFC over the past decade. The films reviewed when submitted by distributors for a re-release are judged against changing standards of potential harm and offence. The BBFC is guided by public consultations involving around 10,000 people. So Empire Strikes Back, for example, um, the established U, this is the BBFC talking, the established U is no longer appropriate and we have therefore classified the Empire Strikes Back as PG. So U in the UK means universal and PG means parental guidance. Um, they go into detail. A man's wrist is chopped off by a lightsaber and during a dream sequence, a man is decapitated. Both moments of violence are brief and without any sight of blood or injury detail. Threatening scenes include those in which a man is kidnapped by a snow creature and a sequence in which a man is forced into a small chamber and encased in carbonate. That's uh, immediately going to piss off every Star Wars fan. Like, Carbon Knights, you bastards. <laughs> I, I, I actually went, I didn't just use this article for reference. I actually looked up the BBFC guidelines. And yes, they say a man is encased in carbonate, whatever that is. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. We classified Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. The film was resubmitted to the BBFC ahead of a new cinema release in 2020. We reclassified Raiders of the Lost Ark 12A for moderate violence, threat, horror, to bring it in line with current guidelines. Now, I kind of get that with Raiders of the Lost Ark. So it was a PG previously, Raiders of the Lost Ark. doesn't actually say in this article, but I assume so if they've gone up to a 12A. Well, I suppose the 12A is above 12, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it could have been a 12 and now a 12A. But I sort of get it with Raiders of the Lost Ark because there is the famous face-melting scene which terrified every child that ever saw it. So I, I was one of them. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty gory, mm. to be fair. I don't think I'd show, I'd let a two-year-old watch that sequence. Yeah. Um, the funniest one on this, by the way, <laughs> Ghostbusters. We have revised our classification guidelines around issues such as sex. And when we reclassified this film in 2011 using the guidelines of the time, the 12A was more appropriate rather than the established PG. Sex references include a scene in which it is implied that a ghost is performing oral sex on a man. Now, it's been a, quite a while since I saw Ghostbusters. I can't remember the scene they're talking about. I should probably watch it again. scene where a ghost is... It's implied. Ghost, it's implied that a ghost is performing oral sex on a man. Yes. And I, I can't picture that, but it's probably been about 10 years since I last watched it, to my, uh, to my shame and discredit. What? I, I mean, I watched it very recently, the original Ghostbusters. But in fact, it was a day or two before I went to see Afterlife. I'm trying to... Yeah. Place the scene. Oh, they could just be making it up. So I have an awful memory because it was very recent. I don't, I don't remember that bit. <laughs> what? Crying out loud. Uh, a few more in here. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, funnily enough, has been uh, reclassified. We previously rated the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation PG in 1990. We reclassified it 12A for infrequent strong language, moderate sex references when it was resubmitted to us in 2020. There's the bit where Clark Griswold's in the um, lingerie store with a, um, oh, and he, he visualizes a naked woman jumping in his pool at one point, doesn't he? I suppose, I suppose if you're going to have like, you know, 
overt sex references, then you should probably put it up to a 12. I don't know. It's a slippery slope, isn't it? The whole, uh, it's not like the whole Mary Whitehouse days where you just try to ban everything that had a bit of go in it. There is sort of, I, I do get film classification. I remember, I remember when um, me and a family friend were a lot younger, probably in our preteens, and we were actually having a discussion and we, um, we sort of reached the conclusion that every single film should be a PG. Okay, but yeah. I mean, that was the other bit I was going to get onto, actually, is um, I've got a young person in the family who recently, uh, she's very young, actually. She's uh, seven or eight, I believe. And she had a kid's Netflix account, but very cleverly, because kids are so tech-oriented these days, she registered her own Netflix account and watched the entirety of Squid Game. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, Squid Game's great, don't get me wrong. Uh, even my, like, my daughter, who is 12, is not allowed to watch Squid Game. I can't think of anyone I know who didn't, I know it's anecdotal, but anyone I know who did not do that, the uh, clandestine raiding of their parents' VHS. And I mean, yeah, okay, I've, I'm kind of transparent about the ways in which I'm certainly messed up, but that's on me. I don't think that's an effect of media on burgeoning brains. I think most people, they are exposed to stuff that, you know, the BBFC says they shouldn't be viewing when they're quite young. But nine times out of ten, it doesn't really have, what, what's the worst that's going to happen? They might have nightmares for a little while. Well, I know we joke about it and everything, but we watch a lot of, I mean, we watch more violent media than most people in a world that is saturated with violent media. Yeah, and we haven't gone and, on and to... neither of us are, you know, knife-wielding psychopaths. We haven't you know? gone on, yeah, neither of us have gone on to replicate any of the specific violence that we've seen demonstrated in any kind of media that, as you say, we've been watching since very young ages or quote-unquote inappropriate ages. So do you know what, to be honest with you, I'm actually more concerned about people who are tasked with the guardianship of those who are dangerously unstable. Keep that sort of media out of their hands. Mm. And as a parent, if you are actually healthfully parenting your nippers, and, I mean, you know, when when me and my brother were like kids, proper kids, kids, my dad let us watch Terminator 2. Yeah, okay, yeah. maybe maybe a 10-year-old shouldn't really be watching Terminator 2, but it's not that, I don't think it's that bad. I, if you say there should be um, certain restrictions, legal restrictions on the 10-year-old watching something like a Serbian film, um, I'd have... I wouldn't really have a lot of mileage to argue against you. No, I mean, no one should watch a Serbian film, no, really. No, because I, I, I would be um, shot down in flames pretty quickly. I wouldn't have much to come back against that. But I'd say the overwhelming majority of stuff, if it is just a little bit of violence and we're not talking extreme, you know, intentionally going out of your way to offend torture porn, I just think if the, pa if the parents are okay with it, I don't think that there should be a... If it, Basically, let me summarise it this. If a kid is being accompanied by their parent in a HMV and they are, say, younger than 15 and they want to they want to purchase something like Terminator 2 or Aliens, I do actually think that it should, it should just be at the discretion of the parents. It's yeah, the parent. I, I do sort of agree with your um, everything should technically be a PG, but that is relying on people to be good parents. And a lot of people, unfortunately, aren't. But for the majority that are, I think, yeah, I, I'm sure everybody with kids listening has made judgment calls on things before where it's like, yeah, technically that's a, quite an adult film, but you have to judge your child individually. Are they ready for that? Is it I mean, going to give them nightmares? You know, are they stable enough? That's something you have to do child by child, I think. Especially, I mean, without sort of trying to go down a whole gender politics line, especially young boys, I mean, they roughhouse pretty early. They they want to access media. Why do you think so many young kids watch professional wrestling all the time? Mm. They they want movies where it's the good guy taking on bad guys, usually with a, a massive arsenal of uh, what have you. They usually grow out of stuff like in the Night Garden pretty damn quickly. So as long as you as long as you're responsible with them, just yeah, it's fine. Let them watch it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of with you, man. And my next article from Variety.com. Michael Keaton is dusting off his signature cape and cowl for Batgirl, the upcoming HBO Max superhero film. The actor is expected to reprise his role as Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, the character he originated in Tim Burton's 1989 film. He will star alongside Leslie Grace, who's playing the lead role. Though plot details have been kept under wrap, the film centers on the heroine whose real identity is Barbara Gordon, the daughter of Gotham Police Commissioner Jim Gordon. As previously announced, J.K. Simmons is returning to portray Jim Gordon after first playing the character in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Brendan Fraser is playing the villainous Firefly, 
a sociopath with a passion for pyrotechnics. Batgirl doesn't have an exact release date, though the film is scheduled to debut on HBO Max in 2022. In the same year, Keaton will be seen as the Kate Crusader in the upcoming Warner Brothers adventure, The Flash. The film, also featuring Ben Affleck as Batman and starring Ezra Miller as the title hero, is slated to land in theatres on November 4th, 2022. So yes, this is Keaton coming back to the Batsuit after 30 years. Wow. I mean, that will certainly imbue me with some level of excitement. I just find it kind of funny that he's returning, not only returning to the Batsuit three decades later, but he's also um, been in an art house lampooning of his tenure yeah. as Batman. A very, very good one. For a lot of people, he's the, their favourite Batman. The Michael I've Keaton heard a lot of people say that, yeah. And mm. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people say that on social media and you have a lot of uh, rabid nerds who guffaw at that and go, oh, Michael Keaton, best Batman. Me, 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 me. But... Um, as a nostalgia kick, uh, yeah, I fully support that. He's the he's the first Batman I was exposed to. Yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah. Michael Keaton was the guy I associated with Batman. Well, yeah, we were too so. late for the uh, the Adam West portrayal. Yeah, although, uh, sadly, because it's awesome. Although I did yeah. watch that when I was younger, and yeah. I'm sure you did too. Absolutely. But that was, yeah, yeah. No one was ever supposed to take that uh, that portrayal seriously. Were they? I think that was sort of the genius <clears throat> of the Tim Burton film. Was it? It was the first uh, film to realize that the comics had become a lot darker. That it wasn't uh, these sort of uh, crazy capers anymore. And there was actual, you know, his parents were murdered and there was so much depth and sort of uh, a gothic kind of thing that you could play against, which is where Batman sort of lived ever since, really. You know, with the exception of maybe the Batman and Robin stuff. Uh, and a lot of yeah. people don't have a lot of love for Batman Forever, although I do like Batman Forever. I'm in the minority. But it's a shite side better than Batman and Robin. I'll yes, that, that is true. But Batman Forever, I kind of like because it did go back to the cartoony stuff, which I thought it did actually quite successfully. And I just love Tommy Lee Jones um, playing Two Face and obviously yeah. not wanting to be anywhere near it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's got a whole level of fun. And you know, Val Kilmer's cool as well. Jim yeah. Carrey is the Riddler as well. It was, it was a fun film when I was a kid. But you know, uh, yeah, I think um, TLJ's Two Face and Jim Carrey is the Riddler. I think that it's it's not really any contest with them as antagonists versus Arnie as Mister Freeze and Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy. I'm sorry, <laughs> the the latter are pretty damn terrible. Whereas Two Face and the Riddler, they fit the you know the the film has a kind of darkly comic tone. Batman Forever, especially in comparison, and they they just make better villains. Whereas on his one-liners, maybe when you revisit it as an adult and you just want to have a pissed-up laugh, like all these stupid stuff. But... To be honest, you're better off watching a YouTube compilation, as yeah. we have done drunk quite a few times. So you don't have to you know, sit through the entire turgid mess of a film. You can just watch all the best bits of Arnie's Mr. Freeze. Well, I remember when my parents took me and my brother to see Batman and Robin, and me and my brother absolutely loved it. And then a little while later, I said to my dad, what did you think of it? And he was just, oh, it was fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very honest and direct. Yeah. I was taken to the cinema as a child to see it as well. I remember we went to McDonald's afterwards and I got a Happy Meal Batman watch, which is probably somewhere in my mum's loft, I would have thought. Must dig that out one of these days. We could give it away as a prize on the podcast. We could indeed, yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea, There'd would be it? be some weirdo out there who wants it. So <laughs> come and fill your boots. I don't think we've got those kind of fans yet, but they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> Anyways, anyways, yes, that is the end of the news this week. I didn't actually, you know what? I'm going to put one little last bit in. I, I almost didn't put it in because it's not really news, but I just made my eyes roll so hard that I'm still struggling to see now. Uh, this is from avclub.com. Avril Lavigne is turning Skater Boy into a movie. Whoopie doo. Yeah. <laughs> Whoopie shit. Yeah. Fuck it. What, is she going to direct and write and star and produce and everything, is she? Um, Recently, with it being almost the 20th anniversary, a lot of people have been asking me to play Skater Boy on some TV shows, so it keeps getting brought back up and people will always reference it to me. And so I'm actually going to turn this song into a film and take it to the next level, whatever the fuck that means. So he was a skater boy, she said she liked. So it's about a guy, it's going to be about a guy who's a skater and she's the woman who's initially not interested in him, but then she probably does become interested in him. Well, I've got, I've got a little bit more from uh, Avril, actually. She explains the deep and meaningful aspect of the song. Oh, yes. You're quite close. The skater boy is in love with the preppy girl, but like, she's too cool for him. But then five years from now, she's feeding the baby and she's all alone and she wishes she would have followed her heart and not tried to live up to society's expectations, she explained. I mean, it's, it's a meaty, meaty plot right there. It's very Hallmark, actually. So Maybe it's going to be her pursuing the skater boy. I don't know if she plans to star in it, direct it, write it, or simply sell the licensing. Um, 
She meets him years, years later after, you know, failing into domesticity. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I run my own skating company now. And she's like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, he used to be kind of like a skater nerd at school. But now he's really hot and buff and I want to date him and have his babies. Well, now she's feeding the baby and she's all alone. She wishes she would have followed her heart. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very, very hallmark. I can see it as a, turn it into a Christmas film. Christmas skateboarding film. I haven't seen one of those yet. I'm sure they exist. But, uh, yeah, all I can really say to Avril is... Good luck, and um, you know I'll be the one watching it because Liam will refuse. <laughs> I thought you were about to say all I can say to Avril is go fuck yourself. <laughs> I'm bird, sorry. That's why Liam will refuse to watch it. <laughs> I'll be the one reviewing that one, Avril. Don't you worry, I'll give you a fair turn. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yes, uh, Liam, as usual, has a couple of film reviews for you. What have we got this week, my friend? Okay, so first up, uh, this one was released late in 2019 at some festivals, but its theatrical release was... Very, very much postponed by the ongoing pandemic. So it is counted as a 2021 release. And it's an Irish one. And it's one that I only came across recently. And this is called Rose Plays Julie. Now, this was written and directed by a uh, husband and wife media team, Christine Malloy and Joe Lawler, who are collectively known as Desperate Optimists. And they have done a lot of uh, art projects over the years, but they turn their hand to filmmaking about 13, 14 years ago, and this is their latest feature. So we're introduced to Rose, played by Anne Skelly, who, um, she's a young woman, she's in her early 20s, I believe, and she is in Dublin practicing to be a vet. She's at um, veterinary college slash university. She's sort of, she's something of a quiet girl, she's rather quiet and studious, and, um, you know, she has one close friend, but other than that, she seems to mill about by herself. And she's, yeah, she's your sort of typical, thoughtful, reflective, um, quite quiet sort in a very, very empathetic way. And we learn very early on that as an infant, she was adopted and her adoptive mother recently passed away. And this has imbued Rose with a very, very overwhelming desire to get in contact with her biological mother. Her biological mother requested no contact with her, but uh, Rose simply, she cannot ignore these desperate pangs. She needs to find out who she is, where she comes from. And it, it completely overwhelms her to the point that she has to do something about it and it's starting to interfere with her studies and just consume her every thought. Now, her mother, Ellen, is played by Orla Brady and um, Ellen is an actress. She's a relatively well-known actress and uh, she's currently over in London shooting a film. We first see Ellen's face when Rose is watching a film on her laptop because she's very intensely watching what seems to be a horror film. We're initially like, well, okay, well, how did, what in the hell is going on here? But then the woman on the screen happens to be her birth mother. And Rose has managed to obtain her details and she rings her a couple of times. First time Ellen picks up the phone is on a film set. And Rose asks her a couple of questions that makes the penny drop. And there's a few hang-ups, mutual hang-ups in between them. But eventually Rose goes over to London to track Ellen down. They initially catch sight of one another on the film set that um, Ellen's working on, but nothing is said. But then eventually Rose works up the courage to go to the house that her birth mother is selling and pose as a potential buyer. And Ellen recognizes her from seeing her floating around and sussing who she is. And um, she asks her to have a quiet word. Initially, she says, right, I don't want an argument, but I'd like you to leave. And Rose is a bit resistant to that. So Ellen eventually relents and takes her out to uh, a nearby wood where she states that she comes there to think and declutter her thoughts and de-stress um, whenever things get too much. And so uh, she takes Rose out there and she says, look, I'm not trying to be insensitive to you. I completely, I understand why you're here. If I, was, if I were in your shoes, I would probably do the same thing. But there's something you need to know. Your father raped me. And you were the result. That's why things are as they are. And so this sends Rose very understandably into a catastrophic emotional tailspin. And the narrative then goes on to detail 
her attempts to build a relationship with her mother whilst also seeking out her father, who is a celebrity archaeologist by the name of Peter Doyle, who's played by Aidan Gillen, um, who's like probably the biggest name in the production. And um, she seeks out Peter and uh, essentially constructs a ruse uh, to introduce herself to him and to get to know him a bit better. And is essentially torn between, well, you know, this man is my father. This man is 50% of why I exist. And also hating his guts because of what she has learned about her conception from her mum. And so it's sort of, it's essentially, it's a very sort of dark identity drama with an undercurrent of revenge thriller, slow burn revenge thriller running through it. Mm -hmm. So pretty, pretty, like uh, you, you up to scratch with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, uh, very dark subject matter. <clears throat> very dark subject matter. But Jesus Christ, I will tell you what, it's fucking hella well executed. Did you say hella? Yeah, hella, hella. That's it, hella lame. Was it the Avril Lavigne reference? The <laughs> no, no, the it's, Car- it's, yeah, it's Cartman, man. Cartman. Says <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. And the other guys remind him how fucking stupid and dumb it is. So I was doing it for <laughs> Okay, no, okay. It was a bit. It was a bit. Rose plays Julie. Uh, this is a very strong film, man. I, I really enjoy this a lot. And Skelly's performance in the, the aforementioned scene where she discovers the circumstances of her birth. The camera lingers on her face with these, like, these woods sort of ever so slightly out of focus in the background. And the way that Skelly's facial expression changes to accommodate this information the this sort of the way she goes from neutrality right through this rapid cycle of horror and sadness the, what the way that she expresses it is completely 10 out of 10 her performance brady's performance gillen's performance all of them are on really really strong form it's really really supported by the excellence of its cinematography and score it's really really well shot but it has this score that is simultaneously melancholic but also threatening there's an eeriness to it you know as we see watch this journey unfold as we watch the internal struggle that uh, rose goes through and also that her mother goes through as well um it, it it builds slowly with this looming sense of menace and the the notion that something devastating might happen but that is also punctuated by um lots of real tenderness as well there's a lot of sincerely poignant moments uh, that fit just as well as the deeply uncomfortable ones. And yeah, it's, it's, it just gives, it has this aura, it's this very powerful aura of mystery and it's very disquieting, but it never goes down the easy route. See, uh, as I, I mentioned that there is a revenge facet to this film and it is, but it's played, it's not played out remotely in the ballpark of audience satisfaction. This isn't um, an adrenaline pumping hunt down the antagonist and there's a nice big cathartic payoff at the end. This this film is very, it's very controlled and it's quite, um, it's austere and it doesn't um, rub the audience's nose and stuff, but it certainly doesn't sugarcoat it because I do think to do so would be insulting. Mm. You've had a lot of uh, what has been termed the this the kind of the extension of the Me Too movement to cinema, and there have been a lot of examples of that. Um, and I've spoken about a few on the podcast. Some have been good. Some have been quite lacklustre. I think that Rose Plays Julie is an example of um, the exposure of uh, misogyny, sort of uh, misogyny forgiven by essentially everyone else but the victims and the victims' outliers who you know have a place of importance in their life and getting some sort of redress to that. I think that Rose Plays Julie is actually one of the much better examples, one of the best examples, sorry, of that theme um, in recent film. And I'll tell you what, if, if you actually enjoy a suspenseful slow burn that is underpinned by really, really terrific acting and a solid screenplay, and moments that w- I can promise you will make you sort of sit there wincing with the, the the raw delivery of um, sort of peeling back the emotional scabs. Um, you really, really should. You should absolutely check this out. I mean, Aidan Gillen is really, really... I mean, he always plays an excellent antagonist, 
But he, he is as one, even though he's a loathsome individual, he still is not, he isn't just your cookie cutter, one dimensional piece of shit. It actually sort of, there's something that examines uh, sort of essentially what you call the man's sociopathy without making him particularly cartoonish. And there's moments that tease at, it. does he deliberate on the kind of things he does? Does he ever feel any kind of remorse? If he does express anything resembling remorse, is it feigned or is there a little sort of, permeation there as to reflection on his actions and yet the two central women are um they're they're really exceptional and I, I i liked this film very much and i'll certainly be thinking about it for a while afterwards everything about it is basically solid i can't think of anything that i didn't like i was totally convinced by it and i really really liked it and yeah, abs- absolutely um thumbs up for rose plays julie definitely check that one out well oh, fantastic stuff yeah, yeah. absolutely and then um, I tuned into another one recently. And this one is from a few years back. This was uh, sort of 2016, 2017. And I had come across this film on certain lists before and thought it sounded v- vaguely intriguing, but I've only just recently watched it. This is a British film called The Ghoul. Now, The Ghoul is um, the feature-length debut film of writer-director Gareth Tunley. Now, people out there might be wondering who Gareth Tunley is. If you're a fan of Peep Show, he was Gog. I knew I knew the name yeah. from somewhere. Gog, yeah. the, the, the guy who place him. The, the guy who Jez basically hassles to try and get a deal with Honda to do the music for the Honda. You know, everyone I, sneezes in his face. Yeah, so like, I yeah. can't believe you were going to go and get me a kebab. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That 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 is Gareth Tunley, and also Gareth Tunley has featured in stuff like uh, Down Terrace and Kill List, the films of Ben Wheatley. He's a friend and collaborator of Ben Wheatley. And Ben Whitley was actually the executive producer of The Ghoul. So uh, he was helping his mate and artistic partner sort of get his feature length off the ground. Good credentials right from the start. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this is uh, directed by Tunley and based on his original screenplay. And this introduces us to a man named Chris, played by Tom Meaton. Now, Chris is uh, an ex police officer who used to specialize in undercover operations and he divides his time between Manchester and London but uh, he is as the film opens he is down in London to assist a close friend of his who is still on the force Um, his friend basically wants his opinion on a really really baffling double murder they're investigating essentially a couple have been shot dead in a house and the forensics show that when they were shot, they just kept walking towards the assailants and they only dropped down dead after the gunman ran off. So initially you're thinking, okay, this is really fucking weird. Mm. And so Chris is, yes, he's perplexed, as they all are, and uh, but he wants to get to the bottom of this. He is intrigued. And he meets up with... Kathleen, played by Alice Lowe. Again, Alice Lowe, um, great. She was, she's been in a lot of, she was on uh, Harry and Paul, and she's also, she was in Prevenge, which is the one I talked about. That was her writing and directorial debut, where she has the psychopathic fetus who telepathically communicates with her. Yes. Alice yeah, Lowe, yeah. really, really has been Can't in. Can't forget that plot. Setup. Yeah, been, <laughs> been, in, been in Ben Weekly stuff as well. Alice, Alice Lowe is a really solid comedy and dramatic actress, like her a lot. Well, Kathleen is, uh, she's also a police affiliate. She is a pathologist and it's basically revealed that her and Chris had some, they have something of an intimate history and uh, they're hanging out and they go to bed together one night. And Chris tells Kathleen that the home where this double murder took place, the double murder of the opening, uh, the building manager is a man named Coulson, played by Rufus Jones. And we gather that Coulson is a, quite a bit of an odd fish he is obsessed with criminology and also crime scenes he's basically like a crime scene rubber necker and they find this to be a very very strange coincidence and while chris is doing a bit of rooting around he discovers that coulson goes to weekly meetings with a therapist called fisher played by neve cusack and so Chris decides, right, I'm going to go and book an appointment and I'm just going to pretend that I'm, I've got some, you know, some sort of mental health disturbance, some problem of living that I need therapeutic assistance for. And I'm going to go along there and I'm going to see if maybe we can distract Fisher with a phone call or something and I'll see if I can 
get some evidence of Colson's files and we'll see if we can, you know, suss out anything from his record, see if it points to a violent history, see if he might have something to do, actively to do with this killing um, that we're looking into. But then he also discovers that Fisher has an associate, um, a Dr. Alex Morland, who is a psychotherapist who has some very, very intriguing habits um, that diverge him from your maybe immediate mental image of your typical shrink. Uh, for, well, for a start, I mean, he's a very, very jovial and well-educated man and seemingly a very well-meaning man, but he does have just a little bit of an intense interest in the occult. I see. And, I was waiting for the supernatural element to come in. Well, I mean, well, it, you know, it's, it's a man who's interested in the occult. I mean, okay. it, 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 occult practitioner doesn't necessarily mean that there's any supernatural inflection. You know sure, I mean? okay. But, but it certainly means, well, it certainly hints that there's quite possibly something sinister afoot. And Chris slowly starts to believe that Moreland and his occult dabblings and Colson, the building manager, and the murder scene, they all might be interlinked in a very, very strange and disturbing way that he is yet to uncover. And uh, this is at the point where he goes very, very much down a phenomenally mind-bending rabbit hole, trying to ascertain exactly what in the shit is occurring here and what he can do about it, if anything. Now. Not, I basically have to leave it at that summary because um, anything else would be, well, I'd be getting into sort of massive spoiler territory. This film is crazy in a way that I was utterly compelled by. First, I'll just get the sort of technical specs out of the way. Really, really liked the production values and it. it's got that furnish that, uh, ben Wheatley himself had for his initial films, especially stuff like Kill List and Down Terrace, where it's shot. Um, there is, it is clear that there's micro budgetary afoot, but it's very, very appropriate in terms of aesthetics. In the same way that it worked for stuff like Down Terrace and Kill List, this examination of the psychological maelstrom that the lead character is thrust into, benefits enormously from this sort of cold and very disquieting, sort of subtly eerie cinematography that the style uh, suffuses it with. And it's also got a wonderful score. There's a, the, when, when I first started playing this film, the tune that opened up, the part of the OST that opened the film up, it, it was just, just this really, really lovely, emotionally stirring composition. I believe it's by Wayne Shepherd, which is spelt... W-A-E-N, I don't know, maybe Welsh Ancestry or something. It's the first time I've ever seen it. Sure, it sounds like a Welsh way. spelling, yeah. Yeah, but this it's got this really, really emotionally stirring, sort of me melancholic, wistful score. That's just a, it has a real, real earworm quality that uh, just uh, that really just buried itself in there immediately. And it recurs as a motif throughout the movie. And so I think that, yeah, in terms of the, the marriage of uh, its visuals and its score, I think that the, it really helps set up this very, very tractor beam unsettling atmosphere that is very, very hard to turn your head away from. And also Tom Meaton as Chris, the protagonist. I love the way this dude acts with his face. Because initially, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's just like the the bluntness of that. Yeah, you know the way he acts with. Well, his you face. know, he, you know, his his his, his <laughs> you know his, his acting without his acting without saying anything. Sure, like, yeah, the yeah. way he emotes, <laughs> love the things he does with his face. <laughs> but um, essentially, the setup I gave you to the ghoul. What if I told you that it is what the film is about, and it also isn't what it's about at all? Well, you would intrigue me very much, sir. Because yeah. I'll tell you what this. As I said, so there's a hidden layer that you can't get into. It is, it is extraordinarily mind fucking, but the way that the film is layered, and the way that it takes us down this rabbit this rabbit hole, the way it leads us along this path, the, the sort of subtle clues and red herrings that it leads oh, you. Oh, so there's like a heavy what? audience mystery participation kind of thing. Oh yeah, we we are talking about um, monumental existential fuckery and maybe even even a bit of um holy shit quantum mechanics scaring the shit out of me now, type thing now i am very intrigued but it is done in a way 
Now, okay, there's going to be people out there who know how I mean this, and I'm not meaning to be cruel, but this film is not made for din loves. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I know. Again, the, the moment those words leave my mouth, I'm already feeling like an arrogant fucking prick. Sentimentalist, film snobs. And I guess, no, and, and I basically am. Yeah, I, yeah. I am a bit. We are. I yeah. am. Like, you know, but, but uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm fundamentally doing, I'm trying to emphasize how much I liked this film because I really did. But it just kind of, you know, it's not the Bill Hicks thing. I don't mean to sound cold or cruel or vicious, but I am. So that's the way it comes out. <laughs> you know, basically, yeah, I decided, so I mean, but this is, um, I actually think that the screenplay, the way this film is layered, I actually, it really, really kept me immersed. And the, revi- the, the, the way that it reveals its reveals, they're not, they're not done like in set piece, sledgehammer obvious way. They're done in a sort of, a, they sort of take you by a, Oh, wow. Oh, shit. Is it actually like this? Fucking hell. Oh, Jesus Christ, this is a bit weird. I wonder where the hell this is going to go. And then, yeah, I found to myself, I found myself, once you get to the end of that journey, I thought, holy shit. You know, that, that is some fascinatingly and addictively, nightmarishly existential fuckery going on right there. And yeah, I really liked it. And, and also, there's a wonderful cameo by Paul K. People will know he's from Game of Thrones as um, Thoris of Mir and was Dennis Pennis. And it's, um, you know, it's all on Pete Tong. You know, I think most people know. I mean, he has about a five-minute cameo in this, which, again, he only shows up then, but, again, just does nothing but supplement the really, really solid acting right across the board. It's If you can find the goal, it's re- yeah, it's not going to be for everyone. It was a polarizer, but I... Really, really appreciated it. I will definitely be giving it another viewing. And it's definitely one of those pictures that really stirred my, what are the other theories? You know, how do other people interpret this? What are their explanations? I found it very, very emotionally and cerebrally stirring. Really, really liked this one a lot. That's very, very intriguing. I'm definitely yeah. going to give that a go. Yeah, yeah. Let me know what you think. I'd like to know what you what you think. Just tell me, yeah. Especially, you know, if you think, like, oh, I watched that film and it was a pile of dog shit or, <laughs> or you know, what I'm hoping for, for you to say like, oh, well, I think I know what's going on. So Existentialism, man. I'm all over it. I love that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, me so, too. Yeah. Well, cool. you know, we, we, I th- I, well, I think we've said before that we have some Nordic ancestry because we do have that sort of weird, like existential pining. You know, things can't just be straight cut. They're like, why am I here? Yeah. And that's, you know, whether you're going down the shops or... You know. <laughs> also scarred livers. You know, yes, absolutely. A lot, a lot in common, a lot in common. <laughs> Okay then, well, TV of the week, and there has been a big release this week, just in time for Christmas, and that is The Witcher Season 2. Oh yes, I've heard this was on the horizon, yeah. Yeah, so it's been a long time coming, this one. They got held up in all the COVID madness, and it's done that thing as well where it's made the second season quite a lot bigger than the first, which seemed like a good idea at the time. And so you've got a whole pandemic interrupting your production. And then sure. it seems like a very, very bad idea indeed. I believe uh, Stranger Things is caught in very much a similar bind at the moment. They've got it even worse, actually, because they're dealing with child actors, which means if you put it off for a long period of time, they go up to a point where you now have to write that in. <laughs> so <laughs> let's spare a thought for a minute for the people working on Stranger Things for, uh, for dealing with that kind Poor of bosses. shit. But yes, Witcher Season 2. Now, obviously, in terms of plot setup here, I'm caught in a little bit of a bind in that... Uh, to really explain everything that's going on with it, I would have to go into the events of season one. And we don't really do spoilers on the free podcast, at least not ones that we, if we can help it. So I'm going to be very, very basic with where we are in the plot, just in case people haven't watched it at all yet. Or I think, yeah, I'll get into it a little bit later, but I think some people might have been put off by certain aspects of The Witcher season one. And I'm about to tell them to go back and watch it again. Hmm. So, bit of a bind, but so I'm going to do very, very basic yeah. here. Of course, we have Henry Cavill playing Geralt of Rivia, the uh, titular Witcher in the Witcherverse, this uh, medieval fantasy universe where uh, magic and mages are a thing, monsters roam the landscape, witches hunt monsters, they're genetically mutated, uh, special human beings that roam around, uh, turning up in towns for small amounts of money. They'll fix your monster problem for you. But they're very much uh, lone wolf, rogue hero types. And let's face it, Geralt is a bit of a Mary Sue as well. He's badass man, good at everything. Despite all of this, I have a huge amount of love for the Witcherverse. I believe I said it in my original Witcher review that I've read quite a few of the books. I've played all the games. It's a, uh, a universe I'm very, very familiar with. Yeah. 
So in season two, we have uh, Siri, the crown princess of Sintra, played by Freya Allen. A big part of season one was that she was Geralt's ward, the, his um, young girl to protect because of events that happened in her home city. Uh, she was then roaming the landscape looking for Geralt because of a prophecy. She's eventually now met up with Geralt and they are going off on their journey together. And a large part of this is Geralt taking her back to the witcher's home castle up in these snowy mountains where he intends to not only protect her, but also begin to train her in the arts of fighting magic and the dangers of the world around them. And so there's very much that father-daughter dynamic developing with them. And there was a big battle at the end of season one. I think I can get away with saying that because everyone expects that of a fantasy show. We're dealing with the aftermath of that and the involvement of Yennefer of Vengerberg, played by Anya Shalotra, a mage who we saw come up through the, if you like, mage breeding program in season one. She was very, very pivotal at the end and has since disappeared off. And I think I can leave it there in terms sure. of plot sets up, really, without going any further and ruining anything for anyone. Now... The Witcher season one feels like a million years ago I reviewed it, actually. It was actually one of the very first TV reviews we ever did on the podcast, or I ever did on the yeah. podcast. And I had some issues with it. As I said, I'm a huge fan of the Witcherverse. I thought Henry Cavill's characterization of Geralt of Rivia was very good. Um, but this show actually had some ropey elements that I wasn't entirely satisfied with. Something At points, it was line delivery. At points, it was writing. And the biggest point of all, the thing that everybody criticized it for, and the reason why I think a lot of people stopped watching it halfway through, is that it did a time-shifting narrative that did not work in the slightest. It was downright confusing. However, thankfully, a lot of people hung on to it because they realized this is a very dark, interesting, and often grotesque fantasy world. And it, that was the thing that the show was really getting right. It was getting Geralt as a character right. And it was getting this gruesome, horrific, dirty, grimy fantasy universe really, really well in terms of production values and in terms of world building. It just had too much going on and splitting them across a load of different time-bending, non-linear narratives didn't really work as a whole. I'm very pleased to report that The Witcher Season 2 has most definitely learnt from that lesson. In fact, and I believe it's in Episode 4 of Season 2, there's a lovely little meta on the nose reference to it. In that the um, bard, Jaskia, played by Joey Beatty, I believe it's Beatty, not Batty. <laughs> there's an E in it, so I'm going to go with Beatty. I should have looked up beforehand. <laughs> but he's one of the comedy characters in it. He's well known in the Witcher universe. He's called uh, Dandelion, eventually. And eventually the show, I hope, will get to the genesis of that nickname. He was a bard that followed the Witcher around in season one. Uh, in season two, at one point, he's attempting to sneak his way onto a boat without any papers. And a guard stops him. And Jaskia starts singing uh, one of his famous bard tunes because he's well known amongst the community. And the guy goes, I know you. My daughter's your biggest fan. Oh, that song. Yeah, yeah, that's one of her favorite songs, that. And he goes, oh, thanks very much, and starts to walk onto the boat. And then the, the guard goes, actually, to be honest, if I can be honest with you, it's, it's not one of your best. I mean, it took me until the fourth verse to figure out all the time-shifting narratives, which I thought was a lovely little nod <laughs> to the, the... The show's kind of got that wry sense of humor going yeah, to it, yeah, which yeah. I really like. That's in the books and the games and the universe as well. So it's nice that that's coming through. I love that kind of self-referencing thing. Yes, it has got rid of the time-shifting narrative. That's not to say there isn't a hell of a lot going on in it. Probably for my money too much. Yeah. As someone who is a fan of this series, as someone who knows the world quite well, even I found myself at points going, hang on a minute, who are they? And what was that kingdom they just referenced? Oh, yeah, no, I remember that. And if I'm doing that as someone that's actually read the source material, then perhaps there are too many plots involved for some people. But what I can say is it's got a brilliant through narrative now. It was the only thing that was just about holding the first season together is you could just about hold on to Geralt's narrative while everything else shifted around him. Now that's become stronger and more unified because all the narratives are moving at once together. It's got some really, really solid individual episodes. The first episode of season two is a flat-out horror movie. It's a mini horror film, mm. which is, it's actually got some of the scariest stuff in it that I've ever seen in a Netflix series, which is really, wow. really cool. Okay. Yeah, I mean, The Witch has definitely got that in its universe. Well, these monsters that Geralt fights, they're not just... I mean, some of them are like ogres and cave trolls and things you expect, but others are more ripped straight from horror films, and it really, really plays with that in episode one. 
it did have me, uh, I never actually do it, but it had me metaphorically looking through my fingers yeah. at points and trying to figure out, knowing my back knowledge of the law as well, okay, what is that and what is it about to do? And even when it did it, it became a, yeah, I mean, it terrified the shit out of my girlfriend. And I think that's that's really, really successful. I'm really, really <laughs> glad the show goes down that, that route, that path. It does actually link in with another criticism I have of season one is that what I really wanted out of it was more um, Geralt being Geralt. As in wandering around the planet, you know, getting, or the continent, as they always call it in the Witcherverse, uh, you know, getting into adventures, fighting monster of the week kind of thing. When the show did that, it worked really, really well. When it did the overarching narratives, it didn't do them quite so well. Season two has got a lot more of the overarching narrative stuff and even less of the individual Geralt Hunt's monster of the week. But given that the narrative writing has come up to a really good standard now, there isn't so much of a problem. What I'm essentially saying is it's a a call-out card to anybody that was confused by season one of The Witcher. Anybody, I know people that were like, yeah, no, I got halfway through that and I couldn't follow it, so I turned it off. I was enjoying it, but I couldn't quite get there. I know it's a bit of a struggle. I know it's a bit of a pain, but please do go back and finish season one and get to season two because the show does cohese itself into a recognizable, hang on to a ball, if that is even a term, form. All the things that were good about season one are now amplified. All the things that were bad about season one have become lesser. It's a show that has learned lessons. And as a result, it's becoming the show that I always wanted it to be. I'm so in love with that universe. And I'm really in love with, well, let's say I was really, I'm really in love with Henry Cavill. I mean, not <laughs> literally, but what I am in love with about Henry Cavill is that he campaigned massively for the role because he is himself a huge fan of the games and the books because he is a nerd like the rest of us. And the fact that he's doing the character so much justice and he knows exactly how to play him is the real strength, the linchpin of the show. The world building around it is really, really great. Yes, there are too many names. There are probably three or four too many characters. Yes, it gets a little bit confused and caught up in itself at points, but it's pushing really quite hard now to an overarching piece where you can go, yes, I understand what's going on now. I'm still not sure what that is over there, but I know it's going to come into play later. It's becoming that Game of Thrones challenger that the series always had the potential to be. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really, really nice to see a show learn its lesson. I mean, I liked season one. I did like season one, but those issues were glaring. Season two sorts them out, puts the thing right back on the path where it should be. So yeah, I'm. That's really good. The only trouble is it takes forever to produce. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was reading the other day, actually, they've only just finished the scripts for season three. So we're looking at at least a year for the next one after that. But I'm desperate for more of it. Oh, and, and slightly annoyingly as well, there are only nine episodes rather than your usual 10. Again, a concession to COVID. Really glad to hear that it's solid, though, and it's actually a massive improvement. Yeah, and as well, given the fact that it was shot under COVID production uh, rules, you know, and all the fuckery that that involves with perspex screens and people wearing masks and all that kind of stuff, I couldn't tell. There's quite a few scenes in this, actually, that are um, really well populated. That they've obviously, I mean, watching them, I didn't really think about it. Then afterwards, I was thinking to myself, yeah, they must have used composited shots. They must have used green screen. They must have used your clever camera angles and screens up at certain points. But actually watching it at the time, I didn't get any sense of it whatsoever, which is really, really cool to see. That's awesome, man, yeah. So yeah, Top Marks, The Witcher is, is turning into the series I hoped it would be. And so I thought- Very I'd- glad to hear it. As you mentioned, Henry Cavill, do you mind if I do a quick 20 second like- No, um, not at all. Are you familiar at all with 2008 film by- uh, Joel Schumacher called Blood Creek. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I never saw it. Henry Cavill and Dominic Purcell play brothers who take on a Nazi zombie vampire overlord played by Michael Fassbender. Uh, why Why haven't I seen it? <laughs> oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's ringing a bell. That might have been something me and you watched together late night drunk. I don't ever recall. We may have done I'm but, sure but it was on like the sci-fi channel. I'm not sure if I'm like going to get it, but I've stuck it on my Christmas list. <laughs> I've got a funny feeling I've yeah. seen it now you mention it. Yeah, yeah but Hen- I'll, I'll check it out again. Henry Cavill, Dominic Purcell, and they take on, yes, a Nazi zombie vampire overlord played by Michael Fassbender. I've got a memory of watching a film that sounds a lot like that with you, very, very pissed at two o'clock in the morning. It's the kind, it's the only sort of time in the morning you're going to find something yeah. like that playing, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, anyone, anyone who hasn't heard of that, you know, I mean, calibre names in there. Yeah. Mad plot. Check it out. Yeah, yeah, cool stuff. Okay, then. Well, speaking about being pissed, actually, I thought I'd uh, do some topical trivia this week. 
Yeah, same as we did last week. There's some uh, Christmas trivia. It was absolutely completely unrelated to the content we just talked about. This week, of course, I've done New Year's Eve trivia. Certainly. Yes, because that <laughs> makes sense in my head. Uh, yeah, New Year's Eve trivia. How about this one for a start? New Year's Eve owes a lot to the Romans. For millennia, humans have been throwing parties, festivals, and religious ceremonies at the dawn of each new year. We haven't always agreed about the year's starting point. 4,000 years ago in ancient Babylon, the first new moon after the vernal equinox was considered the dividing line between the previous year and the new one. January 1st was celebrated as the start of the new year for the first time in 45 BC after Julius Caesar implemented sweeping changes to the Roman calendar. Ancient Romans celebrated the day with sacrifices to Janus, the Roman god of beginnings, for whom January is named, as well as gift exchanges and big parties. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. As you wouldn't think of the, uh, the ancient Romans, would you, and, uh, and New Year's Eve, but there you go. Well, I mean, they got, what is it, um, bloody, is it Bacchanalia? Usually refer, that's usually the term referred to uh, as like wild reverie and mm. debauchery, which obviously comes from Bacchus. God of wine and, uh, and mischief and partying. And that's yeah, I think the, the Romans knew how to party, so mm. just a tad. Nobody knows where the midnight kiss on New Year's Eve came from. Millions of couples, and total strangers, use the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve as an excuse to swap kisses. How this trend got started is a mystery, although we do know that kisses were part of the Roman festival of Saturnalia, held in December, and midnight kisses were traditionally thought to bring good luck in England and Germany. In fact, it seems German immigrants may have popularized the idea of puckering up at 12 on the dot. In 1863, the New York Times reported that New Year's Eve is a great time among the Germans. As the last stroke of midnight dies into silence, all big and little, young and old, male and female, push into each other's arms and hearty kisses go round. Perverse. <laughs> That's all we have to say. It was, it was created by some pervert. What's wrong with a handshake? Do you think the, the kissing at New Year's Eve will die a complete death now? It's obviously haven't been able well, to do it. it probably has. Yeah, yeah, for the past couple of years, obviously haven't been able to do it for I mean, COVID reasons. Just about everyone I know who was very comfortable with a handshake and a hug before is now like bumping elbows. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can't imagine that people will be too uh, desperate to give each other a great big snog. But. If you could hear jingling just then, actually, I've been waiting ever since the Christmas tree went up for Liam to bang his elbow into it. And finally, finally, he just did. I really hope that picks up on my. It was pretty mild. Was just... <laughs> but yes, it was inevitable. For weeks, I've been waiting for you to bang into that Christmas tree. And there was just a slight jingle there. I really hope the mic got it. <laughs> <laughs> New Year's resolutions usually revolve around breaking bad habits or starting good ones. Roughly 45% of Americans make New Year's resolutions and 25% of them break them by mid-January. Yep, sounds about right. Yeah. Do you make any New Year's resolutions? None that I've ever stuck to. It's always seemed, you? No, it's always seemed kind of ridiculous to me. It's like if I want to make a, a change in my life, I'll make it at any point in the year. I don't quite get why the, the switch over is such a big deal. But there's always a, that thing, isn't there, with um, people that go to the gym regularly, hate January, because it's when all these people come in that actually have no respect for the gym equipment, no respect for anybody working there or anything like that. You can see them doing you know, crunches upside down from the ceiling. Yeah, it's like, I come here all year, man. You're, you're going to be gone by February. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely right. In parts of Italy, people welcome in the new year by tossing old things out of their windows. By tossing out the old, they make room for new and lucky things to enter their households and lives in the coming year. Well, I wonder how many fatalities that's caused. Oh, that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> yeah. You can just imagine yourself staggering back drunk from a New Year's Eve party in Italy and suddenly someone's wardrobe comes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was killed by a briefcase with loads of bricks and stuff yeah. in it. So it. Just fell on his head inexplicably. <laughs> Enjoying a glass of champagne is a common New Year's tradition. Originally popularized in the court of Louis XIV, the associations with wealth and royalty trickled down to the middle classes as a form of aspirational drinking. Over time, bubbly became associated with celebration, and in the 19th century, newspapers began to associate champagne with holiday family gatherings. By the 20th century, champagne became a must for New Year's Eve and is now a staple of New Year's celebrations. Bit of champers. Never, I've never really drink champers on New Year's Eve. I'm not fond of it. It gives me a headache. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that crazy about it. I mean, I'll have it, obviously, there's a... 
sort of customary glass that goes around, you know, either New Year shindigs or most often wedding. Yeah. Maybe a birthday bash or something, but I, I wouldn't go out of my way to drink it. Every after. year on Christmas Day, and usually Boxing Day now as well, because I, I go between two families, I get offered a glass of champagne, and every year I drink it, and every year I get an immediate headache. I don't yeah. know why I do that. No, I think I'll just be sticking with the Guinness, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that your New Year's tipple? Yeah, I've, well, I just, I just, you're safe with Guinness. Yeah, it doesn't. Ma- ma- maybe, maybe some chases at the end of the night without overdoing it. It's the only drink, Guinness, that gives me no hangovers whatsoever. No. I can drink unlimited amounts of Guinness, no hangovers. It takes me, it would probably take me up to an hour to drink a pint of beer or lager, but Guinness, I'll, I'll sink that lot of nobody's business. This really does sound like product placement, doesn't it? You know what? I would accept a Guinness sponsorship. It's probably one of the yeah. only corporate you know, things that we'd accept uh, a sponsorship or uh, it's just a few free cases if anybody's listening, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd be happy to um, uh, for Guinness. I'd, I'd we break it. our own rules for, for a case of Guinness. Yeah, but yeah, but it, yeah, but it's Guinness though. You know, it's not fucking. You know, I'll sponsor our silly fucking YouTube channel that yeah. has no soul or this horrible new product from Apple. That's you know, true. It's, it's yeah. Guinness. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Fuck those companies. Any Guinness reps out there? You know, we'll be your friends reasonably. <laughs> In Denmark, it's tradition to smash dishes against your friend's front door at midnight. Finding a large pile of broken china at your door is considered lucky because it means you have lots of loyal friends. In the UK, it means that a load of hooligans will rampage <laughs> you around. <laughs> Just like, you know, a box full of plates. <laughs> if I walk around to any of my neighbours and throw a plate at their front door, they come out with a baseball bat. Like yeah. immediately. Yeah. <laughs> what are you fucking doing, you cunt? In Denmark, it's the thing to do. Those crazy, crazy Danes. <laughs> Usoji is the Japanese tradition of cleaning your whole house on New Year's Eve. The ritual is followed by the Feast of Aseshi, which is a traditional Japanese dish made with fish, beans, eggs, and toshikoshi soba, which is a New Year's Eve noodle. The extra long noodle symbolizes the wish for an extra long life. I thought you were about to say extra long something else there, but yeah. <laughs> sorry. Such an infantile place to go on. Um. My resolution this year is a bigger penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get, you get one noodle. It must be a really, really long noodle. The, the extra long noodle, singular. Well, I mean, people and their traditions, I guess. <laughs> There's a the thing with the Japanese as well. They uh, like KFC as their Christmas Day lunch as well. I do remember I've that. heard about that before. There's huge queues at every KFC. It's like their busiest day of the year in Japan. It's become like a like a modern tradition. I think it started in the 80s or something like that. KFC. Yeah. Well, I imagine there's probably a good few people in the UK who like, well, I mean, obviously, no, KFCs wouldn't be open, but... You, you know. had to buy it the day before and then microwave it. I mean, that just sounds yeah. horrendous. Buy it the day before or keep it at like very, very low heat yeah. in, in some contraption. If you should find yourself in Key West, Florida for the holidays, head on over to the Bourbon Street Pub, where each new year is greeted by a colossal shoe. Every December 31st, a local drag queen known as Sushi climbs into an oversized piece of footwear and is carefully dropped from a balcony. Meanwhile, the residents of Eastover, North Carolina, have taken to dropping 30-pound ceramic fleas on the final night of the year. And speaking of the Tar Heel State, the town of Mount Olive, home to the Mount Olive Pickle Company, observes a New Year's Eve pickle drop where a giant pickle slides down a flagpole. (laughs) I, I, would, <laughs> I would go to the New Year's Eve pickle drop. I mean, that's, that sounds kind of cool. Kind of like the, the Times Square ball, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What was that? Ceramic fleas. 30 pounds ceramic fleas. Yeah, as I was reading that, I thought, I have double checked this trivia. Yeah, 30 pounds ceramic fleas in Eastover, North Carolina. I have no idea why. So a, so a ceramic statue of a flea. Yeah, it had to be pretty big, I would have thought. I mean, 30 pounds is fairly heavy for a... For a ceramic flea. I don't, I don't know what, what they would weigh in originally. <laughs> bizarre. Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all that trivia, really. That's, it's, it's all bizarre stuff that uh, people do on New Year's Eve. I quite like the giant pickle. I'm now hungry for pickles. Well, I mean, no, more power to you. It just seems that getting in a circle and inebriated and singing Old Lang Syne just seems more normal. But maybe that's my British-centric brain talking. On New Year's Eve this year, I'm going to run around to your house and throw a china plate at your front door and see what happens. Yeah? Yeah. I've got a feeling your family won't see the funny side. That's right, mate. I'll be looking out the window for you. (laughs) Same as every night. Yeah. (laughs) I have implements in my house as well. 
Don't take vandalism lightly, man. <laughs> okay, then. Well, on that note, that's the end of our free podcast this week. Uh, we're going to go and record our premium episode now. As we said at the start of this episode, uh, we are going to be doing our New Year's roundup. Absolutely. The films that we loved and the stuff we thought was dog shit. Yeah, we're going to, yeah it's <laughs> important to point out, actually, we're going to be doing our worst of as well. And all yes, the things we didn't like this yeah. year. But, but it's primarily going to be everything we saw that we thought was good this year. So if you'd like to join us for any of that, please do check out cinementalist.com for a link to our Patreon page. Uh, you can follow us at Cinementalcast on Twitter and you can follow Liam at... Liam at the movies at Wacko Jacko's Flicks. And yeah, that wraps up for this week, man. Anything else to say? So as always, guys, thank you so much for listening. Uh, yeah, I hope you have a wonderful New Year's or whatever the hell you're doing, whether you're staying in and just chilling out in front of the TV or you're going out partying. You know, don't party too hard and end up in someone else's garden. Yeah, or do. Um, yeah, write, or, or do. Yeah, yeah, fuck it. Maybe they'll... Write in and tell us how it went. <laughs> Maybe they'll offer you a fry up. Who knows? Or even better, just gather some cutlery and crockery and, and go around to your mate's house and throw it at their door and see what they do and tell, tell them that you learnt on a podcast yeah. that it's a tradition in Denmark. Just say the Danish do it and, you know, and wait for the, like, oh, we, I don't care what the fuck yeah, the Danish do. Danish. Who fucking Danish do you fucking do? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, just have fun. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening and we will see you, of course, next week. <laughs>